Okay, um, I would like to thank um, Alejandro de Acosta for leading us off today. Take it away, Alejandro. Thanks, Jay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming at this this morning with a lot of excitement and energy. <laughs> uh, very happy to see everybody. I'm excited to share this work. As you will see, um, uh, it is in part the story about working long distance, uh, communicating long distance, uh, or maybe transmitting long distance. Um, so it is in some sense also uh, important for me personally and uh, for all of us who are uh, learning and working together, writing together in this high flex way. Okay, so this is called The Life of a Translation Before Publication. Idiosyncrasies, discoveries, explorations, experiments. Everything started with a sentence. A sentence by Ariel Lupino that I found in a picture, uh, sorry, a, a sentence by Ariel Lupino in a picture of a book I found on a social media website. The phrase translated says, everything starts with a sentence by Lamborghini. For me, the great web is research. Social media is for a certain mode of research. I was searching for people talking about Osvaldo Lamborghini and there were few. One was Agustina Perez and she had taken the photo of Lupino's La Risa, the first page, where she had underlined. Thank you. Todo empieza con una frase de Lamborghini. Everything starts with a phrase by Lamborghini. So you probably all know this, the mechanism of desire on social media liking. So I liked the picture with the underlined sentence. By liking it, I underlined it again, as it were. At the same time, I was liking the picture of Agustina's lap with Lupino's book. And that is how I met Agustina and how I ended up translating Lupino. And now Agustina as well, as you will hear tonight. I first read what I could of Lupino online, mostly interviews and book reviews. The novels were initially hard to track down. La Risa, the pamphlet or zine, this is what it looks like. The pamphlet or zine where the phrase todo empieza con una frase de Lamborghini, everything starts with a sentence by Lamborghini appears, was even harder to find and came later once we knew each other. But in the interviews, I could already tell that Lupino communicates by citing key phrases of writer he's read, writers he's read or known, and he also generates copious amounts himself. He cites Hector Liber no comunicar, transmitir. I translate. Don't communicate, transmit. Lupino writes and also says, un texto no puede traducirse, la traducción es otro texto. I translate, a text cannot be translated, translation is another text. Lupino insists on this, that translation is impossible and the translator is a writer in his own right. I'm not sure I agree, but I've taken this to heart to the degree that translating Lupino I've experienced a great deal of freedom precisely as a writer, even as I remain in the heavily constrained space of translation. Lupino says I should sign the translations with my own name, by which I think he means only my name. I have no intention to do so, but what I hear in that injunction is the provocation to write for myself as I translate. Each project has taken on a life of its own, and here are some of the details. The first one I did was El Decapitado, The Beheaded, which was published in this uh, pamphlet or zine form. I read that at uh, last summer's residency. And for those that weren't there or want to review, I will drop a link in the chat.
The first novel by Lupino, Serbia or no Serbia, which I call to be Serbia or not, was much more of a challenge. It was largely written in what Lupino describes in the voice of the narrator as Castellano Trucho, broken Spanish, pronunciado como el culo, the shittiest, translate, shittiest pronunciation, <laughs> maybe the shittiest translation as well. And Lupino said that this was meant to make the novel untranslatable. But you can see how this contradicts his idea that translation is impossible. Indeed, I had to generate a special kind of bad or broken English to stand in for the Castellano Trucho of the novel. This English sounds like this. Grandpa Lovinovich fought Nazis, no lie. Honorable man, true grit. Grandpa Lovinovich crossed the step with a rifle on his shoulders, the straps pressed in his chest. He had dyspnea, dyspepsia, and physiological, mental, and nervous disorders. But Grandpa Lovinovich never tired of walking like a humanoid. His steps could be traced like the trajectory of a particle in a metastable liquid. Homeopath had given him proteins because he had pinworms in his intestine on top of some lung disease and teeth decayed from tartar. Grandpa Lovinovich looked at the blue turquoise sky with success and uniqueness, not a single cloud for his herbalist treatments. It made his Serbian heart mad with joy. His comrades smile as if it were photo time. All partisans of Marshal Tito. The officers had leather hats with ear flaps as a sign of stupidity or mental superiority. But one night, Grandpa Lovinovich lost in the mountains in the firefight. They crossed past Nazi patrol in the meanders of the investigation. Grandpa Lovinovich fell into a cave and broke a leg, metatarsis. It cracked. A lot of pain, strong. But Grandpa Lovinovich pricked up his ears, hearing a strange sound. The firefight had stopped. It was not a Nazi soldier. Grandpa Lovinovich saw a bear in front of him, strong rancid smell, and he had dried blood on his back and breathed with a snore. Um, okay, that was a little bit. I I'm dropping in the chat the longer uh, excerpt that I read um, at the residency last winter. So as I translated uh, Serbia, I had begun to participate in a weekly video chat gathering, nominally a reading workshop run by Lupino, but more like a secret writing workshop called La Otra Caja, The Other Box. And I would share bits and pieces of my experience as I continued to read Lupino and translate him but also listen. This made everyone in the workshop very happy, um, though none of them could really understand English. They, they all watched, for example, when I read that scene. Um, and they were like, and there was some guy who just, his name just said Ocean, and he kept laughing at the funny bits. Um, but anyway, in the workshop, we were talking about translation and rewriting, and they accepted this as my contribution to the collective work. One of the other participants, Manuel Estejes, christened my experiments in broken English, loop English. I went on translating, and I worked on a novella, Tratado de Insectología, or let's see, Tratado de Insectología, um, which I call the Treatise on Insectology and another novel, La Otra Vida, The Other Life. The Other Life was being written as I translated it. Lupino would share a document every week with the members of the workshop. We are expressly forbidden to, to circulate it to anybody else. Each week the document would grow, nothing removed, but things were added. Well, basically we are being given updates on the novel as it was being written. I started translating and some weeks I kept up, others I didn't. Everyone in the workshop was reading the updates as Lupino called them in the text itself. And as is the custom, the other participants would write commentaries, responses, or new texts inspired by the other life, La Otra Vida, in its current version. I just kept translating, making my own version of the text as it grew. Though the other life does not have the Castellano Trucho, there were several other elements that surprised me. There are lists of spare phrases, experiments in translation, small book reviews, or fragments of critical writing, letters from friends, anecdotes, and so on. I had a growing sense that Loop English was not just broken English, but a variant of how Lupino's phrasing should sound to our ears, a kind of clipped, breathless succession of phrases, like this. They were in the middle of a wheat field, the topologist had sunk into a state of constant uncalling. He taught algebra to public high school students. 
the, 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 the topologist stated that there is a logic of the outside and a logic of the inside, but that you can't understand the inside with the logic of the outside. According to him, most literary problems were topological. He asked some questions, nobody answered. The topologist had lived for some years in Germany. The breathlessness is not only in the phrases, but also in the sudden shift from genre to genre in brief continuous sections each with its own title. It's a kind of post loop English, the evolution of the shitty language into something more streamlined and urban, the slick grandchild of the scruffy urban migrant. It's worth noting that around this time, consonant with the weekly updates, I began texting Lupino somewhat regularly, not with translation questions, but to discuss what he had brought up in the workshop or related matters like the fact that we had both once studied philosophy only to abandon it. The most recent phase has been also been the most interesting. I began work on an earlier novel of Lupino's Las Maquinas Orientales, which I call Oriental Machines, or maybe The Oriental Machines, I haven't decided. I realized immediately that I was writing in another variant of Loop English. First of all, because I'd already sensed the continuity between the various novels at the level of the writing, although they do not form a series in any conventional way. Second, because some parts of Oriental Machines make heavy use of street. So let me talk about the specificity of this slang. First, when I talked about broken Spanish before, I was, should really have been talking about Castellano, not Espanol. Espanol is the more common word and uh, for, for Spanish, everywhere Spanish is spoken. But for some reason, I don't exactly know, people in Argentina and in some other places in South America call their Spanish Castellano. Then there is that form of Castellano called Rio Platense, which refers to the zone around the Rio de la Plata, sometimes called the River Plate, and describes the accent and vocabulary of people mostly in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, in Buenos Aires, about a century ago, there developed a slang called lunfardo, associated with uh, poor and criminals, and made somewhat notorious in the lyrics of tango music. That, that kind of lunfardo has gone on evolving after being semi-canonized in tango and persists in part in a nameless, anonymous, constantly evolving street slang. So you see in my little diagram, I just put that in brackets because it has no name. It's just whatever people are saying in the street. Um, that's the kind of slang that's used on and off in the Oriental machines. So how do you translate such a slang? Think about it. If I find the general meaning of an expression like has big balls, I get a much less colorful and much less specific English. I don't get the loop English of Serbia or the proto loop English of Oriental machines or the post loop English of La Otra Vida. If I search in the snow or even worse in the slang I don't, such as certain forms of US slang spoken here or there, you know, in some particular part of some city I haven't been to, I make a crude analogy. I distract the reader from the location of the novel, which is after all a hallucinated dream version of Montevideo, Uruguay. And again, I don't get loop English. One day I had an idea. I wanna make a little detour to explain it. I recalled reading uh, Anthony Burgess 1962 novel, A Clockwork Orange. Burgess was uh, a writer fascinated by linguistic creativity and had not only written a study of uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, but also, I love this, he, he, uh, he, because he wanted people to read it, he made an abbreviated version of it to, make, to get people to read the Wake, which is a notoriously good book. Um, in case you don't know the Wake, here's a little bit. The protiform graph itself is a polyhedron of scripture. There was a time a knife alphabeters would have written it down, the tracing of a purely adelesquescent recidivist, possibly ambidextrous snub nose probably and presenting a strangely profound rainbow in his or her occiput. To the heartily curious, 
curiousing entomophilus, then it has shown a very sex mosaic of nymphosis in which the eternal chimera hunter, Oreolopos, now frond of sugars, then leaf of salts, the sensory crowd in his belly, coupled with an eye for the goods, truth bewilder blissed by their night effluvia with guns like drums and fondlers like forceps, persequestellates his Vanessas from flore to flore. Somehow this sounds like the purest kidio, kidulium, wherein our massive, okay, I'm gonna, I need, you gotta practice if you're gonna read the wake out loud. And I picked that passage visually, but I didn't, sorry, I mean, it gives you a sense of what it's like. Well, um, in, a, in a clockwork orange, Burgess invented uh, a kind of working class British English. And, and the idea is that the, the novel takes place in an alternate timeline where there's been an influence of Russian on street English, world class English. And so he devised an entire argot, NADSAT, in which Russian words take on English resonances. But he also used influences from Cockney English, from German, often childish rhyme schemes. So for example, uh, you learn that droogs means friends, and you get a kind of mixture of, um, of well, I don't know, maybe I'll, instead of describing it, I'll just show it to you because I have a passage of that as well. Just a second. So this is a, a brief passage from A Clockwork Orange. We yacated back townwards, my brothers, but just outside, not far from what they called the industrial canal, we vidied the fuel needle had like collapsed, like our own ha 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 needles had, and the auto was coughing, kashal, kashal, kashal. Not to worry over much though, because the rail station kept flashing blue on off, on off just near. The point was whether to leave the auto to be sobby ratted by the roses, or us feeling like in a hate and murder mood to give it a fair tall chalk into the starry waters for a nice heavy loud plesk before the death of the evening. This ladder we decided on, so we got out and the brakes off, all four tall chalked it to the edge of the filthy water that was like triacle mixed with human whole products. Then one good horror show tall chalk and in she went. We had to dash back for fear of the filth splashing on our platties, but splish and glop she went down and lovely. Farewell, old droog, called Georgie, and dim obliged with a clowny great guff. Ho, 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 ho. So if you compare that with the passage for, uh, from, from, uh, from Joyce, you see that there, there, there's the same kind of, you know, sort of spazzy linguistic creativity, but in, in a sort of um, more attenuated way, right? It, it sort of enters in the way, you know, no, nobody speaks wall-to-wall -wall slang, right? We all have different degrees in which slang enters into our everyday speech. And so that's, um, that's an example of this. Uh, uh, work by Burgess. So when the when the novel, um, well, okay, first of all, when Burgess did this, uh, he, he, he part of the reason he, he invented this slang, he said, so his novel would not become quickly dated by using contemporary slang. And I think he's right. If he had used slang from 1962, it would immediately sound dated. In this way, you read it now and you're sort of drawn into the sort of endless novelty of these created words. Um, interestingly, when the novel appeared in England, these terms were all left for the reader to make sense of. They're, they're supposed to make sense by context. Um, and I'd be curious, you know, whether you, you, you felt you could understand what most of those words meant. Obviously, it's easier the more of the novel you read. When the novel was translated into Spanish as La Naranja Mecánica, Burgess was so interested in the process that he participated in the creation of the Spanish version of Nadza. So there's a parallel Spanish argot that um, he, he helped create. And when it was translated into Russian, the translator uh, used the influence backward and created a series of um, imaginary Russian words influenced by English. So drugs, which is, uh, I believe based on druga, something like that in Russian, which is friend, um, became friendy for example. So I included this detour partly to show how research, which I mean, it's just a, maybe a fancy way of saying reading, enters into my translating process. But as with my original search for people discussing Osvaldo Lamborghini, all of this is of a piece. So I wrote Lupino one day and I told him what I had discovered about Burgess 
parenthetically, I read this novel maybe when I was 16. So I vaguely remembered that there was a special language in it, but I had to go back and look at it again. Um, I would love to know what I thought about it when I was 16. I have no, no memory. Um, but I told Lupino that I wanted to invent a different version of loop English specific to the Oriental machines, a kind of imaginary English slang, as if the Rio Platense slang had affected our American English the way Russian did the British English in a clockwork orange. Lupino is very excited since a clockwork orange or rather La Naranja Mecanica is one of his favorite novels. But I needed more help. The slang in the book in Las Máquinas Orientales is too current to be registered in any dictionary, which is uh, one way of saying, oh, it's not the slang. I live here, I don't speak that slang. So um, I, I needed help. I had found a dictionary, you can find them online of the older slang, Lufardo, so you can get that stratum. And I found you know, a wiki-like site, a little bit like Urban Dictionary, if you know that English site, where uh, people write more or less reliable you know, uh, 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 explanations of current slang. Um, but this only got me so far. I could make words that resembled each other and originated from the street slang in parallel ways, but I needed a deeper meaning of what people were actually saying or how it was used. So here, Manuel Esteges, the, 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 the person from the workshop who christened Loop English, um, came to my aid together with Francisco Magallanes, who's also in the workshop, also a novelist and publisher in his own right. And together we initiated a new group chat specifically for this purpose in which I would submit the words and my guesses at their use. I always tried to guess from context. Um, and each of them would clarify from their own experience of how the word was used. They didn't always agree. Sometimes only one of them knew a word, and sometimes neither one did, and we, just, we realized we had discovered a Lupino neologism. I want to underline that it was kind of by intuition that I ended up writing Lupino about conceptual matters, but the discussion of the translation phrase by phrase and sometimes word by word was now the work of this new translation chat channel uh, that I had with these other two fellows. Um, okay. So with the help of the translation workshop, and again, on analogy with the supposed influence of Russian on English in a clockwork orange, I began to assemble a glossary of American English words that functioned in a word, in a world where our speech had been influenced by the slang of the Rio Platense streets. It sounds like this. A delegation of third worldist priests had arrived in the neighborhood to help the kids addicted to coca paste when they weren't suffering the commissar with his baseball bat or riding crop and his gang of sicarios. But those little priests were shandies. They sold a resin cut with steel wool and bath salts. The kids went into spasms every time they smoked that shit. Here the new word is shandies, which translates chantas, meaning something like cheaters or fakers. Why not just write cheaters or fakers? Well, first of all, the meaning is clear from context Okay. Those little priests were shandies. They sold a resin cut with steel wool and bath salts. And this is exactly the way Burgess does it in A Clockwork Orange. Right? The rest of the sentence already leads you to that sense. Second, a new, a new word adds some color or mystery. It gives you the general sense, but not something exact. You still have to guess. And it is exactly like that experience we all have when we go somewhere and we, we pick up on some new slang. We have a general sense of what people are saying, maybe from body language or tone or circumstantial thing but it's not yet a word we would use. So it retains right, uh, 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 experiential alien foreign quality. Um, third, um, I didn't do this all the time, but since there was an opportunity, uh, Shandy is also a tribute to uh, Lawrence Stern's great novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. It just occurred to me that way, um, but I like hiding references to authors. <laughs> so there is one. Um, okay, so that, here's another example. Um, I couldn't get my yayo, and it was Gregorio the stutterer's fault. Talking with him was harder than running in flip flops through a mud flat. I wanted to mash up his nose by pistol whipping him once, then again, and then again. Gregorio was inflexible, like a rotten Ottoman king on the edge of senility. He could throw together a messy plan based on any old payback. Here, here you will have noticed, just like in the previous passage, I left 
every time they smoke that shit. Um, here I use yayo, which is ordinary American street slang for cocaine. Although I, I thought it was fun to leave it since um, I'll put this in the chat. Yayo is the form, you know, if you go to, uh, it's, it's the form you find more commonly, but that's actually a, a, a kind of Americanized spelling of the second one I put there, which is the one you would find in Spanish. Um, but anyway, the new, the new word is there at the, at the end. Um, he could throw together a messy plan based on any old payback. Um, so this somewhat phonetic and a land tender is pavada. Pavada is something trivial. Um, the the made-up word is pay bad. Pavada, pay bad. And obviously when you read it, you see pay and bad and it, it's, it puts you in the right kind of context. It's not exactly the same. Um, but once again, he could, throw the, he could throw together a messy plan based on any old pay bad. Most of the meaning you need is there before that last word. Any old, mm, you know, you could even imagine a situation where someone wouldn't even finish their sentence. Any old, uh, you know, is already there. It's a little bit what the, the yada, yada, yada joke is in Seinfeld is about like how much talk is filler, right? And if you think about that as a writer, what can you do with all that filler? Well, you, you don't want to write filler, but you can use the filler effect to add words that know it, that you just made up that, do, that, that make the text kind of sparkle. Right. So this is a little bit what I got into doing. So um, that, I think, is the is the loop English I had been searching for, in a sense. This is my kind of invented or, you know, more hinted at than complete street talk corresponding to the Castellano that in Tubi Serbia was spoken in a distorted way by an immigrant, the proto loop English. And so here I'm going to share with you a complete glossary, which I made strictly for my own amusement and to share with friends um, like Burgess, at least in his British editions. I don't plan to include it, uh, you know, when Oriental Machines is published, but it, but uh, I assembled it a little bit just to give myself the sense of. Um, oh, wait, that's a different one. Just to, just to make sure that the words had a certain kind of um, verbal resemblance. No, sorry. Got two windows open. I'm trying to share the right one. Aha, there it is. Okay. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna just read down the English side, which are the capitals, and you'll you'll see that there's certain sounds that the words have in common: fagade, zust, cash to bash shit, stir her stuffing, yampon, bikaki, lupini, matuffi, disguzzy, farfade, easy peasy, beast of two shit, silly side, pingayo, patty stud, bitches. All right, that's that's I didn't invent that. Fayuted, real maniac, chichis, yauchad, piltraff. Buff, Tarasca, Shandies, Farson, and Gaitos, Papilla, Kapanga Copper, Begay, Deary, Colgays, Kariak, Paybad, Fairylets, Churls, Collarland, Fakon, Fatchy, Golpizzi, Reggie, Giddy, Gaiety, Forret, Foilo, Kagit, Merlazi, Chacheri, Manyik, Milko, Churls, Grassets, Bafaroon, Shangarins. Um, this is this is this gives you a, a sense of you know I, I, I expect you can under you can hear there, there's certain tones that I want them to have and these are all sounds that I think are relatively common in American English and so there's there's a kind of standard way in which I transform the words so that they would end up for example there's a lot of y's and z's which are not not as common in Spanish and Castellano as they are in, in English and so that that pattern holds but I also did it because I like the way they sounded because they sounded funny or silly or in certain cases, like with pay bad, I was actually you know, adding little bits of you know, component words or with Shandy, there's also one in there, Lupini, which is making fun of the author's name. So that's, that's, more, or less the, <laughs> that's more or less the product of my, my, uh, my process. Okay, so I have one more anecdote to share about um, this experience of translation. And then I'd love to hear, um, 
yeah, uh, what you think about it. Hola, el bebé de maña. Uh, okay, so in Las Máquinas Orientales, uh, which I'm calling Oriental Machines, there is a palindrome. I put it there in the chat. A la gorda drogada. So the palindrome, the phrase that reads exactly the same backwards and forwards is obviously the most, it, it is like the most impossible translation problem because you, you simply cannot you, you can't retain the semantics and the, and, the, and the letter order. It basically puts you face to face with the difference between the languages. So I tried building my own palindrome uh, uh, overconfidently based on the semantics of the phrase, which roughly means give the fat lady drugs. Um, and this was well beyond my skill level. <laughs> um, Palindromes are a whole special hobby that some people get very preoccupied and obsessed with, but uh, uh, you, you can't just pause in your translation and, and make up a palindrome. Um, so that, that didn't work. So then I just went on the web and I found long, long lists of palindromes in English, and I just tried combing through them to see if I could get any of the components, drugs, lady, fat, giving, you know, and to see if I could get, get closer to the meaning, nothing. So I discussed it with Lupino and uh, the members of the translation channel, and I solved the problem conceptually. There is a, a, a writer, another Argentine writer, Juan Fijoy, who it so happens has written a, a book called Carcino Tratado de Palindromia, a treatise on palindromy. And in this book, he gives examples of, of uh, palindromes in many languages, including English. I'll show you some pages from it in which you, you, you won't be able to read uh, the Spanish text. Oh, wait, that's not right. Um, but, you, but you will be able to read the palindromes he chose. These are really good palindromes he chose, by the way. He dug deep. Dog, a devil, deified, lived a god. Sums are not set as a test on Erasmus. I, man, am regal, a German, am I. <laughs> Egad, a bass tone denotes a bad age. Live dirt, up a side track, carded is a putrid evil. Okay, so there, there are some. Ma Madame, aha, tis level, sit, aha, madame. I did not sob, oh, Boston, did I? Okay. Or snug G raw was I ear I saw war G guns. Uh, the problem is that none of these had anything to do. I mean, it, there's one good thing about um, the 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 one that appears in the Oriental machines, a la gorda drogada, is that it doesn't have much to do with what's going on in the scene. It's just someone gets a note and there's a weird palindrome. They say, "Oh, it's palindrome," but that's that's it. I mean, it it doesn't like have to do with the plot. You don't have to understand what that phrase means. You just have to register that there's a palindrome. So all I had to do was find one that was right. And in another page of this, I found it. You can see it there towards the bottom. Lewd did I live and evil I did dwell. Um, now, I, I decided to keep this one. Lewd did I live and evil I did dwell for two reasons. First, the tone and the content, is, it is... Uh, I think has to do, there's a lot of um, people in, uh, in the Oriental machines living a kind of rough life. So they live a lewd and evil way. But the, the last thing is that I felt like this was the most specifically in English palindrome because, let me share this again. The center of the palindrome here is not a letter, or not exactly a letter, but a symbol. It's the ampersand. Because it has an odd number, there's one central character. Okay, now um, the ampersand is not used in Spanish. So, or at least it's, it's, if it is, it's very uncommon. So it's something that can only happen in English. So this is like in, in some sense, a doubly English palindrome but it's chosen by an Argentine author. And so I said, okay, very good. That's the palindrome that's going in Oriental machines. Um, 
this sense of like, I can do this, <laughs> right? this feeling of freedom, I think comes from being in constant communication with those folks. Um, it is not something that I think I would do just on my own for fun, because I would be too preoccupied if I were like having fun and, and, and not, um, I'm not going to say getting it right, you know, because there is no, no way of getting this right. You know, I looked at the Italian version of, of Oriental Machines and the translator put in an Italian palindrome. I don't know. I mean, it's not impossible to solve this problem. But I felt like doing it in dialogue with the other folks made it made me confident in my decision, even as I amused myself in doing it. All right, so I'll wrap up here uh, since I'm caught up in my process, but obviously this is not the end of this experience. In my research, I've navigated in a way familiar to many of you, and I think is, is increasingly a process that people are going through from reading on the open web to targeted contacts on social media to the intimacy of group chats and video calls. As I pause in my work on Lupino to work on Agustina's novel, Caperuxita, which I'm gonna be reading from tonight, I am brought back to the beginning of this search or research since I met her first, and I'm beginning again with another writer in an entirely different approach to language. Hers is Baroque and delicate and also abrupt and cutting at times. So I'm very far from Loop English. And I don't know what this English will be called. Even as I am daunted by the task, I know I have community and a first audience in my online friends. And this is really the only time I feel I can use that word about such an experience, friends. And the reason why is that we're writing to each other every day. We do leave audio messages and do group calls and all that, but mainly we send phrases. Everything begins with sentences that are transmitted. And this transmission, I think, is the origin of all literature, but this also shows that what we think of as literature comes after the fact or is derivative. The translator gets at the writing inside literature. The writer transmits sentences. Okay, that's the talk. Thank you so much for listening. I would love to um, hear questions or comments. I love this idea. Or, hi, I'm Jess, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm new. <laughs> uh, I love this idea of, uh, of course, when you reference Seinfeld, I'm like, oh, uh, how the yada yada, the talk is filler, uh, or so much of talk is filler, and you don't necessarily need the word itself or the words themselves that you can infer and you said in writing you don't want the filler but you can create your own words and just like the notion of creating your own word or create or kind of experimenting and <clears throat> allowing the reader or who's engaging with it to create their own definition or it's the definition itself is inferred in that word so i don't know i think that's a really interesting idea that i've never thought about so <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, it, it's something that, I mean, I, you know, when I read A Clockwork Orange the first time when I was 16, I was just reading, basically all I wanted to read was dystopian fiction, <laughs> uh, a lot of which overlaps with science fiction. And, and almost all of those books have a kind of jargon in them that, that is part of the world building. You know, the, the jargon, for example, in things like Brave New World or 1984 has just so good that it's just passed into common usage, right? Newspeak, you know, uh, unperson, uh, wrong thing, all of that uh, from, from 1984. Um, and I think that um, that's something that doesn't have, I mean, of course, it's, it, it is one of the, for me, the best things about, about uh, uh, genre fiction that, it, that, that it, it accepts that. But I also think that that's just a feature that everyone should be capable of taking advantage. I mean, for me, uh, this was in a sense, a, a solution to a translation problem. But I hope you can tell I was just starting to have fun just as the writer I am all the time making up words, right? And, and realizing this is something that's not limited to this. 
Um, Lydia may put this in the chat. It's very Dr. Seuss, like this concept has passed us all at one time, but I sort of forgot how easily those strange fake words passed over me as a kid. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, and I think that like that's, it's interesting to think about that position of the child as a reader who, who simply accepts, um, you know, who, who's not concerned with what is or isn't a word. At least I don't, I think most children are not initially concerned with that, especially if something is presented in a rhyming or sing-song way. <laughs> um, when I've shared uh, Finnegan's Wake with people, they often have a very bad reaction. And then if you try reading it out loud, especially if you read it out loud a couple of times, you can at least accept that, that it has a music to it um, that still does not necessarily you know, make it something you wanna read all the way through, but, but that's how it works. And, it, and if you think that it's just a cerebral thing of reading quietly, then you're not, I think, taking it on. But I think the shift from what Joyce did to what Burgess did is, is, is to me maybe the most practical one. You know, um, I think you can only write the wake once. But Burgess basically took it as license to create words and you know imagine relations, and that I think is is the part that I got excited about. Other thoughts or questions? I'm Roz. I don't think I've necessarily met you yet um still kind of matching names to faces but yesterday someone was talking in the room telling a story about like a teacher had asked the student to write a poem and the student asked how long the poem had to be and the teacher said it didn't matter and so the student wrote their best friend's phone number on a piece of paper and turned it in <laughs> and I just thought that was so sweet. And I was reminded of it um, when you said this was one of the only contexts you would use the word friend. I think you were meaning like to describe an online relationship and um, descending of, of the sentences that are like the start of your interactions. I don't know, I just kind of made a connection there. And it seemed like these were your poems, your messages to your friends kind of. Yeah, um, I think I think that I mean the one thing I think about you know I, I talked about how um, I do write Lupino a lot, but um, Lupino uh, sends text the way he writes his novels. So it's it's very like the idea of asking him like what did you mean by this word seems bizarre. Like I, I couldn't conceive of doing that. I just I just like having a relation to him. I like listening to him and talking to him. But a lot of times when the stuff he sends me, it's almost like he's just writing to himself or, you know, he's not really, it's not really like a back and forth like texting usually is. Whereas at just the way it turned out with the people in the, in the writing, you know, the translation workshop, they're specifically interested in this. Like they don't speak English. They want to, you know, and so I'm asking them questions and talking to them and telling them what words I'm making up. And it's a different kind of experience for us. Um, so those are like specific in the texture of how each person is. You know, and these other two fellows are different kinds of people. I'm the way I am. And that, you know, the more formal thing you can do as a translator, which is like, you know, write the author and say, look, you know, like, what did you mean here? And, you know, I mean, I've done that. <laughs> I've sent people letters with lists of questions. Um, but um, I'm, I'm more interested in the, the kind of long-term relationship. And that's, like I said, I mean, it does feel like a, a friendship that's tethered in you know, in these these particular technologies we have, which I've never been especially comfortable using. Um, and so I was surprised to what degree I was excited about it. But, you know, um, it, it, it's funny because I, just because of the, the specifics, people in Argentina tend to that. So I started using WhatsApp. You know, if I open like my messages on my phone, it's just people I know telling me things. It's very quotidian and every day. If I open WhatsApp, every single message is about writing or literature or translation or, you know, it's like a, I have this kind of dedicated app all about creative writing. Uh, that's just how it's turned out. And that, that's, um, that's kind of the, the, the motor that all this translation is coming out of. So, yeah, it is, it is a little bit like turning in your friend's 
number because uh, that, that list of numbers is in some sense also my list of projects, present and future. Alejandro, um, yes. really great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I am thinking, I mean, I'm guessing this is really going to sync up pretty nicely with Viki Now's talk on um, collaboration. Um, and I'm, you mentioned I, I needed to check with the, or something about the translation channel. I love that phrase. That's sort of the group, this sort of group of people that you're connecting, you're sort of speaking with through essentially Twitter. Can you say a little bit more about that? Oh yeah, um, in that case, it's not it's not Twitter. Twitter is how I initially met these people, but um, mainly mainly it's it's the group chat on WhatsApp. Um, but I call it the channel <laughs> workshop or channel just because it's 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 dedicated to that. That's all we talk about. Um, and and that was mainly what we've done is work through the the slang stuff. Um, but um, but the the idea is it's going to remain open. I mean, there there is a you know, on in the future, Francisco, which is the guy I, I talked about less, uh, who's in there, he has a novel that I'm planning to translate. And so we're going to do it together in the channel. You know, that's going to be done kind of in, in real time, day by day. Um, so um, it now that it's set up, it has it has a kind of use. But I like I love I also like giving these things. And I don't know, chat is, is kind of a not a word that excites me. Channel is a word that excites me. It's the same way. <laughs> I said when Libertela says, "Don't communicate, transmit." You can either say those are basically synonyms, or you can just you get excited about whatever whatever transmit is that's better than communicate. I'm going to get into it. So I say channel. I'm tuning into the channel in the same way that there's no specific reason that WhatsApp is, you know, different. I mean, I could be in a group chat on Twitter, but. As it's turned out on my phone or on my computer, WhatsApp is the dedicated one for communicating with these folks. So that's how I that's how I use it. I'm going to read Justine's uh, comment in the chat. This talk is making me think about translating across mediums. We translate across languages. What could it mean to translate or transmit a physical line? Maybe we could call this a drawing into a word. Um, For me, I mean, I, I, I can't really talk about this from experience, so I'm just going to refer back to the thing I did do, which is the, the conceptualization to the palindrome problem. Um, I always just go back to where I start, which is research. You know, I poke around, I dig around until I find something that interests me enough that I feel like it's relevant, right? And so the, if I couldn't translate the palindrome by making my own quote unquote impossible translated palindrome, I poked around until I found something that was like in a conceptual space that seemed right to me, like an English palindrome chosen by an Argentine author with a specifically English character, the ampersand. Um, so I think that, you know, the, if you give yourself the project of how do you make a physical line into a word, I would treat that principally as a, as a research project. First of all, like I'm gonna figure out things about lines and things about words and you know and obviously the first thing you do is you narrow the research project so not not just any line not just any word but as you go around moving around that kind of conceptual space you find information and at least in terms of what i'm talking about today hopefully you will also find people and now there's a bunch of uh, uh folks in the mix um <laughs> if I open messages on my phone, it's just people I know telling me things. Well, isn't that what the, that's what texting is? Mostly things you already know or already expected. I mean, the filler, you know, the thing I said about filler goes even more so. Um, although people try to try to shorten it. Um, yeah, I think I, I will say, I mean, in anticipation of, of these talk, that yes, this is, in one sense, I'm talking about collaboration and, you know, to go back to where I started, um, I'm also talking about exactly what we're doing right now. I mean, it's, 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 it's significant that we are to some degree used to the of being distributed throughout country. Um, 
and and for me, you know, um, this experience of translation has been entirely like the experience I've had because of the possibility for real time communication, because of the rapidly involving other people. You know, um, I think that listening to the voice of the writer in this, you know, this other setting of his his his, his workshop every week. And talking with him right and just having his voice in my ear has had a tremendous influence on how I translate him and, and more is, is more important than any question I could ask him. I know how he talks you know I know how he forms his phrases um, th these are opportunities you know that have been now placed in front of us right and and so I mean my kind of hesitation around the use of making friends online is specifically that for me the word friend has a little more weight um, I, I, I think I have to do more than press a couple of buttons or, you know, like someone's pictures or whatever, but, but I do, but I take seriously after this experience, the, the idea that, you know, um, I can be much more intimately involved in the lives of people far away and they can be involved in mine and, and that writing and, and projects can come out of this. And I, the speed is, is notable. You know, I don't particularly tell myself I need to work slower or faster. I just do things at the pace that seems right. But, you know, I translated four novels in a year. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that, that I think owes something to this energy. If I could ask a question, this is Allison. I think to the point you just made in terms of speed, I was thinking a lot in the talk about, um, I think when something makes it into the dictionary, in a sense, it's kind of dead or it's past its expiration date at that point to me. And when you're collecting um, language or dialogue in the streets in real time, as you just situated, that's like fresh to me, that's taking it from the source. And I, I'm thinking a lot about like, what is the timeline of language? Like what's the lifespan? Like when is it alive, fresh, new versus like canned or preserved or decaying? Um, buried. And I'm also trying to connect that to um, concepts of power. Like I think a lot about there's ways I speak in my home, or I might speak with my partner, certain internal slang or inside jokes, language that is actually particular, particular to people that are insiders, um, that are maybe not insiders in the larger landscape of the institution or academia. So I'm also really curious about like, this kind of reversal subversion of power in terms of if I'm collecting street slang and then I'm doing the serious, rigorous academic work of, of getting peer reviewing with my translating channel, like talking about it, how you've kind of um, retooled language in that capacity in terms of power. Uh, who knows or understands what's being said versus who is not understanding. So I'm curious in terms of like time and, and power, if you want to comment. Yeah, thanks, Allison. No, that's that's very much the case. I mean, I, I'm a step ahead of the dictionary. I mean, the only thing I found that's like a dictionary, like I said, is this is this wiki site that I kind of compared to Urban Dictionary. You know, if you look at Urban Dictionary, it's whoever wants to put something in does, right? It's not a reliable source. It's, it's often, it, it often is <laughs> reliable, but you can't, you also can't count on it. Um, be, um, because people people lie, people make things up or they distort or, you know, the, or they have like a hyper local sense of what something means that isn't relevant if you're checking from somewhere else. But that's, that's the nature of it, you know, and I basically, I am, how can I put it? So as uh, you know, I made I showed that kind of diagram of the different levels of generality or abstraction of Spanish, right? And as you go farther down, you get more and more specific until the lowest level is just the words Lupino himself made up. But the level above that, which is this kind of nameless street slang, which is used there, you know, I right like I don't speak. That's not the Spanish I speak um, uh, because I'm not there, right? I'm not there right now. I don't live there. Um, of course, I have, you know, more so than people that don't speak Spanish, I have the capacity to pick it up and use it. Um, so there is this kind of latency that we have as speakers of a language that we have, we can in some sense navigate into, into spaces and be open. Um, we can also have people navigate into our spaces and share, share what we have, right? The way you can share an inside joke um, or a bit of intimate uh, language. But, um, I do think that like that, I think part of the excitement for me in terms of having this loop where 
my I'm, I'm talking, communicating, direct, listening to the to the writer in, in one ear in the other ear, listening to people who are part of, let's say, his broader but still very small linguistic community. And I'm kind of part of it, right, as a, um, in a very unmediated way, right? I mean, think about what would I be doing if, you know, if I didn't have all this and someone had given me this novel? Well, I basically have to either look these words up in dictionaries and then, you know, in my kind of discussion of the slang, I'd have to either replace it with slang, you know, instead of making up words, I'd just be kind of more clumsily equating words, right? And so what, what's making, helping me to do that well, it's the dictionary or it's my own antiquated sense of, of what works, right? I think there would be a lot less sparkle in that. Um, so, you know, um, in, terms, in terms of power, I guess one thing I would say is like used properly, these technologies allow us to move faster, <laughs> right? I mean, I think the dictionary will catch up eventually. And when Burgess, you know, said he made up the slang in a clockwork orange so the book wouldn't sound dated, you know, I thought about that and I said, okay, well, it's true now, right? I mean, it's true that you can open up the book and, you know, no one's saying groovy or something else that would immediately sound like, okay, that's old slang. But at the same time, you know, in 500 years, it will sound dated because no one, right? We can't, we can't look at a 500 year old bit of English and know what was fresh language at that moment and what was, you know, already hackneyed, or at least, you know, that require that does require some kind of expertise. So it's something that works you know, for a while, it's temporary. Um, that's of the nature of living language, right? That's of the nature of slang. It's like, it's, it, it's like fashion, right? It can't stay the same to be to be what it's supposed to be. Um, anyway, those, those, those are my reflections. Um, I, I think that, you know, I'm not saying anything against the dictionary, you know, but I am saying something in favor of a judicious use of the dictionary, just like a judicious use of the urban dictionary or resources. I mean, in terms of research, I'm completely promiscuous and there's like no resource that I will not poke at. Um, but, but I think that what Allison is reminding us of is that there are kind of hierarchies in, in terms of the, the sort of degrees of importance these things are granted or come stamped with, you know, in Spanish, uh, and, uh, unlike in English, there is actually a, a royal academy in Spain that decides what is officially Spanish and what isn't. You know, the French have this, English speakers do not. Um, but nevertheless, there are other agencies that more distributed in indirect way work, work in this way, you know, and being trained academically in part, you know, or, 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 or having professional standards or these kinds of things in part means like understanding and using language norms, right? But um, that's not how good, <laughs> novels are written uh, you can't be ignorant of those things but you also can't you know can't be subordinate to them so alejandro um let's let's give let's give alejandro a hand amazing thank you so much um Really quickly, um, I'm gonna put in the chat for reminders for those of you coming into 511 building, workshop room, professional practices, room 313. Um, the the uh, mine and V's workshop is in room 413, this room, and then Allison and Latanya's workshop is in room 310. Um, Y'all have a good workshop and then faculty, I'll be on the Zoom in about um, about five minutes. So um, thanks a lot, Alejandro. Great start. Great start. Thank you.